سيداتي وسيدتي مرحبا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته هذا شرف كبير من شاني بحكي معكم اليوم and I think I'll switch to English at this point to benefit those of us who don't really speak Arabic so my name is Talia Miron Schatz I'm a decision scientist I study medical decision making and I'm here today to talk to you about how to motivate behavioral change in patients let me tell you what I'm going to be talking to you about I'm going to start with non-adherence to medication um, you might tell me, wait, we don't deal with medication, we deal with devices, or we deal with lifestyle interventions. I'm going to make the claim that people who don't adhere to medication do so for reasons that are also very relevant for the above, for lifestyle interventions, as well as for devices. I'll talk a little bit about the extent, I think the alarming extent, would not be overstating it, of non-adherence to medication, and also about its causes. Two main suspects I'm going to mention. First one is information. Do people understand what we're talking about? Do people actually know what the medication are for, what their medical condition is to begin with, or even how they need to take their medication? I think you can see pretty much where I'm going, and where I'm going is that the answer is no, but hopefully I'll illustrate and convince you in the process. Then I'm going to talk about motivation, because really motivation is key. You can throw in all the information you want, and even if people understand it, unless they're motivated, they're not going to initiate a behavioral change, they're not going to start taking medication, let alone sustain the change or persist with their medication. Next, I want to introduce you to two seemingly innocent concepts, but actually they are huge revenue robbers. The first one is adherence. What's adherence? Adherence is, is the person taking this medicine as prescribed? Is he taking his full dose every eight hours and does that without eating an hour earlier? Um, on a more technological note, you can say, is this person really recording their blood pressure on their app, which is really cool and they were very excited when they downloaded it? Is he really doing this every day like he vowed he would or is it like every other day when he remembers? The second revenue robber is persistence. So you can be non-adherent, you can be skipping medication on and off, but as long as you're still on the medicine, you're still persistent. So the question of persistence is very relevant to medicine. If you're on a statin, you're not supposed to ever stop being persistent. You're supposed to be on this treatment on and on. And likewise, think about it even for apps. We want you not to just download the app, we want you to repeatedly use it. These two, as I will show in a minute, are revenue robbers to the degree that non-adherence has been uh, titled an, an epidemic. Why is it an epidemic? Because it is so hugely prevalent, and I'm going to show you in, the, in a second not only how prevalent it is, but also what a huge revenue robber it is in terms of cost to pharmaceutical companies and also to insurers because if people take their medication, hopefully their health improves over time. So I did say non-adherence and non-persistence only seem innocent, but actually they're huge revenue robbers. And here's the proof. Out of 1.75 billion prescriptions filed a year, you see the blue bar on the top, which indicates how many of them were actually filled. And you also see the green portion of the bar. Don't be mistaken. It's not innocent. This one shows how many prescriptions were never picked up. This is called preliminary non-adherence, which means the person never even initiated, never started a treatment. The row below that indicates how many prescriptions were not only filled, but also properly, adherently taken. So again, the red part of the, of the bar here indicates how many prescriptions presumably were filled properly because we don't really know, we just know that they were filed repeatedly after the time that was presumably indicates proper um, uptake of the medication. The green portion of the bar you will notice is big and it suggests how many people have not been taking their medication as prescribed. Again, 1.75 billion prescriptions, that's a lot. You might want to know why people don't pick up their prescriptions and why they're not being adherent, or as I call it, why, oh why, are they doing this? Colleen McHorney from Merck published a paper on the adherence estimator, as she called it, and she says that 
88% of patients who are at risk of being either medium or high non-adherent do so for three main reasons. The first one is concerns over the medication. Will it have side effects? Will it be effective at all? I call this information, that's the informational part where it's your job to make these people more confident in the medication and to reduce their apprehensions. The second cause is disease related. And here people are asking, should I even take care of this condition? Maybe it's trivial. Maybe it's going to go away. And maybe nothing can help it to begin with. The last cause is probably the less interesting because that pertains to concerns over affordability and everyone pretty much knows how to tackle those. So I'm really going to focus about the informational and motivational aspects of non-adherence and how to shift those, hopefully, with behavioral insights. So what specifically are people saying? What are their main concerns when not taking medication? The top concern is financial. 56% of people who don't pick up their first prescription do so for reasons of cost. And that's really the number one cause also of not pursuing with the medication. I think it's interesting that really the same causes pertain to not taking medicine in the first place and to not pursuing it further, which makes me think that there's a trend here which also relates to apps, to devices, and to everything lifestyle related. The second cause is fear of side effects. That's understandable, but we don't know to what degree this fear is really justified, and this is where information kicks in. The third reason, which keeps 32% of people who receive a prescription from taking it in the first place, and a slightly lower proportion of people who file the prescription from using it to the full extent, is that they don't like medication. Now this is pure attitude. Information alone is not going to help here. Something else needs to be done to shift this. Um, I spoke recently with someone about menopause medication and she said a lot of women shun from them because they say, I keep a natural lifestyle. Her point is, well, it might be natural to have heat waves and to sleep poorly, but is this really the best way to handle your life? I don't think so. You might want to take medication. And there's a huge obstacle there. You might ask, what's wrong with people? Don't they get it? Don't they get that they need the medication? Don't they get that some conditions don't just go away or that the side effects might be mild compared with the benefit from the medicine? I'm going to claim that A, people don't necessarily get it, and B, you know what? Sometimes it's our fault, and by us, I mean anyone who ever communicated to a patient. Why do I say that? Because sometimes we create the information in a way that really tells patients, you know what, you're not supposed to get it. I'm going to show you in a second a slide that I downloaded from the DNA Direct website. It shows the founder of the company, a very talented woman, looking and contemplating information that pertains to one's genotype and a specific segment of the genotype that tells you whether or not tamoxifen is going to be beneficial for you. Just look at this slide for a moment. You see a lot of information and you see a host of big words and you see a complicated illustration. And even Ryan, the founder of the company, looks at it, seems very, very pensive. Dude, this is hard to get. If this is hard to get and I'm a DTC consumer, should I even be buying this service because maybe I won't be able to get it? Now this lady looks really sad, which is no coincidence because she's there selling us medication for depression. The ad starts with the words, understanding depression. And it tells us how depression works and that it's not just going to go away, it's not a mood, it's actually a condition. The part of the slide that I'm worried about, which I really highlighted in red, is the exact way this medication works in people is unknown. What does that tell me? That tells me that understanding depression is a big title, but understanding what this medication is going to do to me is really beyond me. How long will it take to kick in? Should I even try to understand? Maybe not. And if I shouldn't try to understand, what do I rely on? I rely on the way I feel. So if I take this medicine for a day or two or three or even a week and nothing's happening, I know I can't understand what's going on but I know I'm not feeling any better, so why should I continue? 
this is where information would have been very useful because we all know that antidepressants don't take a week to kick in they take much longer but again the information is often not there so this one's too good not to share it with you and that's the beta blocker enigma why an enigma well a lady was prescribed beta blockers by the doctor. She left his office and said to the nurse, um, he gave me beta blockers, what exactly do these do? And the nurse said, well, you know, they do something for your heart, they're good for your heart. Okay, she went to the pharmacy, asked the same question, got pretty much the same answer, which wasn't really satisfactory. She came home, looked at the medication and said, what's the beta ever harmed me with? Why am I blocking the beta? Maybe that's a bad thing. Maybe I should be unblocking the betas. She never took the medication. Again, innocent mistake, lack of information, did not instill motivation, no adherence. The lady with the beta blockers didn't really know what to expect. I want to share with you results from a study I did regarding the BRCA1 and 2 genetic testing. The BRCA1 and 2 gene mutations, you may know, are associated with a high prevalence of breast cancer. So I ran a study with a few colleagues and we asked women what the most important things are for them in this test. The first aspect we asked about the test will give me information about my BRCA1 and 2 status. Now that's a no-brainer and most women found that very important. Next we had two trick questions. The first one was the test will tell me with certainty whether I will develop breast cancer we gave an option of saying the test can't do that. Leaving the depressing world of genetic testing behind and moving on to the cool world of apps, let's look at this one which helps patients record their medication when whether or not they took it and whether or not they took it on time. It looks really cool and it's fun to look at but let's think for a moment. Does it take into account cognitive limitations? People who need to use this, people who take this many medication this many times a day, how old are they? How well do they deal with so much information, so many colors? What is going on here? Do they know what's good, what's bad? Do they notice when something went wrong? Is this the best way, the ideal way for a person to approach their medication on a daily basis? I know what you're going to say. You're probably going to say that the app we saw is self-explanatory. Sure it is, yeah, of course, to you guys. You guys are smart, you're techie, you're savvy, you're educated. Should I go on? So who are we creating these apps for? Who are we creating this information for? Are we creating it for 90 million Americans who are of low health literacy? Health literacy being the ability to deal with health-related information and to ask questions. 90 million Americans are of low health literacy, which means they can comprehend information when presented to them at the sixth grade level or below. So much for information. I just want to tell you that when a person doesn't understand what you're talking about, it's very hard to motivate them to take action. Let's assume for a second that information is not a problem, that everyone gets it. Does that mean that everyone is going to not only initiate but also persist with behavioral change. This beautiful lady probably suggests the opposite. Show me a smoker who thinks smoking is good for them. Show me an obese person who's never read anything about the perils of obesity. These people know that they're doing something which is wrong for them. Why then are they still doing it? They're missing something and what they're missing is motivation. What then constitutes motivation? What's this elusive concept made up of? How can we generate it with our patients, with our customers? The Edelman PR group generated the Edelman Health Engagement Barometer. They did this by interviewing 15,000 people, 5,000 of which in the United States. And here is what they came up with, which I think can help us create messages which are better geared toward our clients and to figure out what it is that motivates them. Note that the first thing people are motivated by is a personal moment, a life moment. A thing such as going up on the scale and saying, whoa, what's going on here? Um, having a doctor say, 
Mr. So-and-so, we need to talk. I think it's time you need started taking blood pressure medication. That's the first thing. And this is a life moment. You can't create this moment for them. The second thing is a loved one connection. And while you can't create that for anyone, you can sort of fake it. And I'll show, it, I'll show you how in a minute. What the Edelman Agency meant by loved one connection was having one of your family members or friends suffer from a certain condition or knowing that what you're doing is affecting them. So like I said, this is not something you can mass produce, thank God, but this is something you can generate in messages. The last component there is trusted information or advice. And trusted information has two elements to it. The first one is information I can understand because if someone's saying things to me which I have no clue what they're talking about, it's going to be a little bit hard for me to trust it. The second part is, why would I trust this person? Maybe because of their expertise, but maybe because of something which is a little bit related to the loved one connection. Because I think they're really talking to me. They care about me. They want my good. They want what's best for me. And therefore, I should trust them and follow their advice. How is this accomplished? It's really very simple. A study that was done with HIV AIDS patients found that one question can predict whether or not they're going to be adherent to their medication, which is also associated with better health results. And this question was, do you feel your doctor knows you as a person? If you think your doctor knows you as a person, then yes, you're likely to be more adherent. You're likely to follow up on visits. You will take your medicine and you will have lower levels of the HIV related serum in your blood. What this tells us is that information is not just about the knowledge, it's also about who conveys it and how it is conveyed. And the more emotional it is and the more personalized it is, the more convincing it is and the more motivating. How then should we talk to patients? We should talk to them like we know them. In fact, we should try to get to know them as much as we can. Victor Stretcher from University of Michigan has really cool work on smoking cessation. What he shows is that when you tailor a message to match a person who's receiving the message, they're going to be more convinced. So if you talk to me and you say, hi Talia, I'm a woman like you, and here is what I've used to quit smoking, that's slightly persuasive, but if you really want to hit the nail on its head, you could say, well, Talia, like you, I'm a woman, I'm a mother of three children, I'm an academic, I'm a consultant, I juggle my work and my family, and I smoke two packs of cigarettes a day, or at least I used to, until I learned these terrific smoking cessation methods. This slide shows on the top a very low level of tailoring, just tailoring according to gender, and on the bottom, much more fine-tuned tailoring um, which is related to the person's gender, their age, their family status, their race, etc. This is just one example of needing to know who you're talking to. As a psychologist, there are many more levels I can go into, not just the demographics, but also the person's characteristics and what would make them tick. But even using this relatively low level and relatively simple level of tailoring, can be highly beneficial. We've learned, I hope you've learned, that behavioral insights can make a difference. They can make patients understand things. They can create motivation. They can perhaps generate immediate consequences where none exist because if you start taking um, depression medication, nothing happens for a while. Something needs to sustain the change. Something needs to sustain you taking the medicine one day at a time, over and over again, until finally you see the benefit. We've also learned, I think, or at least this is something I know and hopefully have conveyed, that behavioral input is key where sometimes we see trends but don't really understand them. I've used it 
to find out why HIV AIDS patients are not really succeeding in treatment or at least why some of them are not succeeding in treatment and what we've found is that it's because they're being non-adherent then can go back and find out why they're being non-adherent and perhaps rectify that. I've included all of these things on my almost final slide because they make a difference and because non-adherence and non-persistence be it to medication, devices, apps, you name it, is so prevalent and so hard to overcome that you really need a comprehensive approach to handle it and the more complex the intervention the more likely it is to succeed and be sustained over time. I'd like to thank you for being with me this afternoon. I want to invite you to write to me with your comments, with your questions, with your insights, with your input on behavioral changes you've seen or perhaps such that you would like to see. Shukran kteer wa